Hey, hockey fans, T Boz is 13 and 3 here celebrating our 100th episode with hockey icon, Fort Erie, Ontario native, longtime Minnesota North Star, and wild radio personality, Tom Reed. This episode is sponsored by Riverside Bike and Skate. Met, uh, Hertel Law, Kelly Heating and Electric, Dooley's Pub, Market and Johnson, Northwoods Therapy and Associates, and Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, which has been committed to the health care needs of patients in western Wisconsin since 1954. Mogi. This is really cool. We've been coming to Tom Reed's here uh, once in a while throughout the year to do some podcasts. He's been gracious enough to allow us to use his establishment here, um, but he's in the he uh, hasn't been wanting to get behind the microphone here and talk with us for some strange reason, although he's made a couple of appearances on uh, Tom Younghands and Reed Larson. So uh, we got the man himself today, our 100th episode. Welcome, Tom. You say 100. I thought you were talking about my age or something here at that point, but not quite not quite there yet. But I'm getting closer to it, hopefully. But we'll see where it goes. But welcome once again, and congratulations on your 100 tonight. I uh, picked up a copy of Reed's book the other day, and I'm sure it's going to be interesting. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but uh, always fun, especially when you know the players and you know what's going on. And, you know, in all my years, I've been involved in hockey since I left home back in 1964. So I've met a lot of players, seen a lot of guys over the course of the years, and, and uh, they're tweetering out on me just a little bit. You know, they're <laughs> starting, to, starting to leave me, and I, that I don't like. But no. at the same time, it's been a great, great ride. Awesome. Well, you're kind of like the Energizer Bunny. You just keep going. And I'll tell you what, every time we're here, you, you're always on the go. What what keeps you, you know, motivated? What keeps the energy? You know, the one thing is that I like to be active. And I think by keeping active, you keep a young mind and you're always trying to look to, ahead to what, what's coming down the pike and what you can do. There's nothing worse than I see uh, people who retire and I have nothing to do. I've got two full-time jobs the way I look at between broadcasting with the wild, which I really enjoy, and they're awfully good to me, but also having this restaurant, which I started back in 1999. So I've been, I've been pretty active all the way through. I don't golf anymore like I used to. I haven't golfed in six years, but oh. I used to enjoy it. But hopefully, I said this summer I'm going to golf. I got my shoes in the car, my golf shoes. I don't have the golf clubs yet, but I'm going to get them. <laughs> <laughs> One step at a time. <laughs> well, we still have some summer left, so hopefully you get out there one of these days soon. You start, or you are a defenseman by trade. When did you start playing hockey? Well, I started skating when I was two years old. My dad would build a ring for my brothers and I in the backyard, and that's when I started to skate. And then uh, when I was eight years old, when I was able to join a, a league, we uh, the Pee Wees back in uh, Fort Erie, Ontario. People often say, well, where's Fort Erie? I said, it's right across from Buffalo, New York. I said, when we were kids, we used to have fights with the Americans. And they actually would throw dynamite at us. And then we'd be Canadians. We'd light it and throw it back. Oh. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. How about you? That was good. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we're a border town right across from uh, Buffalo, New York, right where the Lake Erie uh, dumps into the Niagara River. Uh, just before Niagara Falls, we're 15 miles, 15 miles from the falls. So it's a, it's a beautiful area. You know what? And I appreciate it. every time I go back home. It's just a gorgeous area to go to. And if you've never been to Niagara Falls or Niagara in the Lake, especially, it is absolutely tremendous. You, anybody going there would walk, walk away with a, uh, uh, certainly a great re uh, memory of what it's like to be around the falls and going under the falls and going under the Maid of the Mist and yep. all those different yep. things that you can do there. And lots of vineyards there now, which is really good. <laughs> There you go. So you mentioned earlier that you left home at, at, in 1964. And really, you've been in Minnesota since you got here with the North Stars. I believe it was 67. So what kept you here all these years? You know, I... I, I love the area here. When I when I played here, you know, I broke in with the, the Blackhawks in 67 and a couple of years there and got traded to Minnesota in, in uh in February of 1969, and have uh, made this my home. And my brother and I had a sporting goods store in Canada in Fort Erie for 40 years. Uh, mm -hmm. I had sold out to him, but uh, after 9/11 and the, the Peace Bridge crossing was difficult to go from one country to another country at that time with all the different regulations put into place. So I had sold out to him a number of years before that, but he had it for 40 years, very successful business. And he, he's got a home about three miles from the brink of the fall. So he knows, he knows what it's like right being right on the water. But I just, I, I love the area that people, it's like Minnesota. People think, well, we're down there. 
uh, you know, Fort Erie is actually farther south of the Twin Cities, about 100 miles. If you go 100 miles south and go due east, you'll run into Fort Erie. Wow. Uh, that's, yeah, people don't realize that. But we do get hit with snow, uh, like Buffalo does, not quite as much as Buffalo, but the wind currents take it across Lake Erie. But uh, it's it was a, a great upbringing. And as a young kid, I spent hours and hours in the, my local arena down there. I used to work as a rink rat, and I would work from on weekends. I couldn't wait to get the, get up and get to the rink in the mornings. I'd be there at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, two days, and I'd make $2 for the two days. And sweeping and scraping the ice in our day, we had to scrape the ice with big scrapers, and then we had the big 45-gallon or 55-gallon drums of hot water to, to melt the, the excess snow. We would scrape it, and we could do a rink uh, with the other guys. We could do it in seven minutes, so it was it was. It was, it was a lot of fun. And, Quicker than a Zamboni. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, and we used to pull the pipes. We always had the fireman's carnival at the end of August, and then we'd pull the uh, they tear down in the arena, the stage and everything. We'd tear that down, and we'd actually pull the pipes and laying on top of the trash floor. It's six, six miles of pipe we would lay Holy uh, during the course of the night, and they were heavy because they were filled with brine, which a, a lot of arenas still have to this day. Okay, interesting. Who, who was your influence in hockey when you were growing up? I mean, what what got you motivated to play, and who was the biggest influence? Well, my, my, you know, I, 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 in Canada, we all played hockey. I mean, that was our sport, but we played all sports. In the summertime, it was baseball. In the fall, it was, you know, college. It was a high school football. We golfed. We swam in the Niagara River. We did everything we played. And I always tell kids, play a lot of sports. Don't get, don't be tied down just to one sport. Because when you play golf, when you play baseball, when you play tennis, you do all this. I mean, the coordination is so important. And, and uh, to tie yourself down, I see too many parents who want their kids to, they, he's going to be a hockey player, he's going to be a football player, and, that, and that's all they do. And they miss out an awful lot. I mean, maybe they're going to be a penis someday. I don't know. You just really don't know what, you know, it's going to, you know, uh, you know, mark their territory, the, the, what they want to do. But I always tell kids, play as many sports. I tell parents this, too. Let them play as many sports. It'll, you'll figure it out in the long run. They will what they want to do. So you mentioned your dad built a rink for you. Was was he a hockey player as well? Or Yeah, he was. He played in the, in the local league. In fact, uh, he played with uh, uh, my dad a little bit older than uh, Pierre Palat. When Pierre Palat was a kid growing up in Fort Erie, Ontario, and of course he's an all-star defensive for many years with the Blackhawks, and I had the chance to play with Pierre in Chicago when I was with the Blackhawks. But my dad uh, played hockey. He actually was going to go to Europe one year, and he got involved in a... Uh, in the old days, in the 30s, you know, they had the running boards on the car, and he was, uh, he was, had hitched a ride, which they used to do on the side, uh, the running board, and a car came off, uh, through a stop sign, hit him, and, and uh, damaged his legs. So he wasn't oh. able, to, was able to, to, to go to Europe and play hockey. But he was a big influence in my life in, in playing hockey, and never, never pushed me, just said, have fun with it, and, and I did, and still do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> You had mentioned you started out with the Blackhawks. <clears throat> Back when you started playing, there was really not a draft, but more that you became the right, your rights were given to Chicago. How, how did that transpire? Tell our listeners how that comes about. <clears throat> they gave me $100. Oh, <laughs> and that did it. Is that what it was? <laughs> $100. You have to sign a C form. And that C form enabled them to have my rights. Uh, there was a draft back, but it wasn't a very big draft. There weren't a lot of players involved in it. And, of course, the transportation to get to these small communities was really difficult, especially you're getting to northern Ontario, Quebec. I mean, you look at Alberta and Saskatchewan. It was difficult to get to those places to watch to watch and see what was happening uh, with the, uh, the different players that were coming through. And being in Quebec, of course, all being French, French-speaking, Montreal always got the best players because they all want, all want to play for the Canadians. That's why Montreal had so many you know, star players over the years, which I was fortunate to play against. That was my favorite team as a kid growing up, and Jean Beliveau, Mr. Beliveau was my favorite my favorite player. And I just, uh, Not that I was a forward, but I just the way he carried himself both on and off the ice was tremendous. So when you left home for St. Catharines, was that a... Was that a long ways away from Fort Erie or? or? No, 30 miles, 30 okay. miles away. It was built in a house with two other players. So your folks still and, got uh, to come and see you quite a bit? Yeah, they saw they would come every, every weekend. We play games. Of course, went to school also. And I can remember sometimes we get, we get back from Peterborough, Montreal, we hours in the morning and the phone would ring and I'd answer it and it would be the, the school calling, just checking to see if Tom Reed was here. And so he got hurt last night in the game. He won't be at school today, but maybe <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> They, they never questioned me, so 
I never asked who, was, who was they were talking to. Yeah. So I didn't know that. Good for you. <laughs> All right. Um, you went from St. Catharines. Um, you played pro- uh, your first professional game with the St. Louis Braves. Was that a minor league affiliate? affiliate it, it was, team? I believe it was the St. Louis Blackhawks. They were the St. farm Louis team Black. of the Chicago Blackhawks. Okay. And I had made the all-star team in the OHA that year. So, uh, my first two years, I was still growing, so I was not very coordinated. In fact, I had applied to the uh, University, of Mich- University of Michigan to try and get a, a hockey scholarship to go to school. I want to be a recreation director. Oh, okay. And I had taken my courses for refrigeration so I could run an arena and run the equipment and so on. <clears throat> But they turned me down. They said I, they didn't think I'd be able to make their team. So instead of playing for the University of Michigan that year, I played for the Chicago Blackhawks. Oh. You showed them, didn't you? True story. True story. But, wow. But I, in fairness to them, uh, when I was still growing, I was very uncoordinated. All right. You know, 17, 18. Yep. When I got 19, the things started to fall into place for me and was much, much better. Wow. Okay. So you make, the, you make that <clears throat> jump to the NHL at, at that time. If you were if you were in the corner battling, who was the guy you didn't want to go into the corner with? Well, I'd rather go in second. You know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's going to be the one yeah, dishing yeah. up, dishing it there, all. there were a lot of guys. I mean, I mean, Gordy Howe. You know, I talk about Gordy Howe and how tough, I, and he was. I mean, to have the opportunity to play against him was tremendous. And I told a lot of people, I thought Gordy's eyes were going near the end of his career because he thought the puck was on top of my head a couple of times. That's <laughs> 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 just the way it was. But it was uh, he was he was he was fun to play against. But I don't think there's anybody that really. I was afraid to go in the corner. I mean, that didn't bother me at all. And uh, so uh, there, there were some tough guys. And we only had, you know, we have gone some 6 to 12 teams, remember, back in 1967. Yeah. And being an expansion team, we had some of the older uh, players from the AHL, the American Hockey League, or the Central Hockey League that uh, were part of, part of us too. But they were guys who didn't much, get much of a chance to play in the NHL. There were a lot of guys who could have played in the NHL, but they never got that opportunity because there's only six teams. Sure. And with six teams, I think you had 19 players per team. So you can, if you can figure out the math, that yeah, there weren't a lot, lot of, of openings. Guys. Now, with 32 teams and all the different leagues you have and the guys going to Europe, and all, the opportunities are endless for these people to, go, to get their college education and get a, you know, a chance to play pro hockey. It's, 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 it's great. It really is. And I, I'm really happy for the guys. I mean, they make a lot more money than we ever made, that's for I sure. Yeah. You know what? But they, and I, because I follow... You know, the team and follow the wild. These guys work hard every day, 12 months of the year. There's not much downtime for them. We would start at training camp, get our skates off the, the nail, and then at the end of the, the season, hang them up again and get them the next year. We never had uh, some ice. That was the problem. Oh, now sure. there's a lot of ice, uh, you know, arenas uh, around, a lot of uh, f- opportunities for kids to, to have uh, games in the summertime, you know, have you know, like the, the beauty league they have here in the in the Twin Cities, and it's really good for the guys to be able to have that competition, that uh, pro competition to play against. So you you played a little bit of time with St. Louis, and it evidently was the Blackhawks. Uh, then you also played in Dallas for for a little while before coming up to the to the Blackhawks. Yeah, so that, yeah. does that surprise you now that here we've got all these Southern teams? It's like that must have been like oh, yeah. a hockey wasteland back in that day. Oh, it was. I can remember being in the, when we first went to expansion in 67, and all of a sudden now we've got, we've got, you know, Los Angeles Kings, the Oakland, Oakland Seals. I mean, we're the Golden Seals. We're thinking, well, and I'm thinking, how can anybody play golf or play, excuse me, golf? Yeah, of course. <laughs> how can, how can I play hockey in, in weather like this? Now yeah. I know how. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having that opportunity, when I see guys come into the rink in the southern cities in flip flops and shorts, and we're we're bundled in you know forty below weather up here <laughs> yeah. and snow, it's it's a it's a lot different. <laughs> what was that like transitioning from the Blackhawks to the North Stars? <clears throat> it was fairly easy. It really was. It was you know in nineteen sixty nine. There's still only twelve teams in the league, and I didn't know anybody on the on the uh, Minnesota team when I got here. John Mariucci picked me up from the airport, and I didn't play that that particular game. Uh, but uh, it was uh, they made it. The transition was actually pretty good. The guys were very welcoming, led by you know, led by Lou Nanny uh, and Ray Cullen, our captain at that time, and Moose Vasco. And I knew the names of the players just being a young kid growing up and watching these guys. 
and listening to them and so on. But uh, it was a, uh, it was, it was good. And Ren Blair was our, our general manager and coach, and he was a, uh, he was, he was, he was a fireball. He was a very interesting coach. <laughs> You got a little tongue in cheek there. It's, any stories you can share about that? Uh, he was great. He was, if he get mad at us, instead of facing the ice behind, when he's behind the bench, he'd face the crowd with his arms crossed, and we'd say, "Ren, who's up next?" He said, "Doesn't matter. Give me any five because I know they're going to score. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were going to score on you." Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the confidence boost, there, coach. <laughs> but he was great. I mean, he, the one thing about you know coaches. I mean, it's a Today, it's you talk about being babysitters, and you have to be a psychologist, and you have to be like a mother hen. And there's a lot going into coaching today. It's, it's it's changed so much, and we didn't have the you know the equipment they had have nowadays. Um, is so much lighter and so much more protective. And we didn't have helmets uh, because helmets would sissify you as a player if you yeah. if you wore a helmet. So they didn't want us wearing helmets. And and it's hard sometimes to recognize players. In the old days, you could recognize just by their hair and how they skated and all that. But everything is so identical today in, in equipment and what they have that it's it's uh, it gets a little bit difficult sometimes. And the broadcast locations are really high, so you can't sometimes you can't even see the numbers down there. They're so far away. Sure. You so mentioned. Oh, go ahead, Mo. So you entered the league as a as a tough defensive defenseman. So where did that style of play generate with you? Were you is that the way you always played, or did yeah, you develop I, that as you as you yeah, went? Yeah, I like I like the physical part of the game. I like I like that part of it. And that and I'm not talking about fighting or anything like that. I'm talking more about just be, using your size. And I was probably one of the bigger guys in the league at that time, six two, about two hundred and five pounds. And uh, now, I mean, uh, these guys are six six, six seven. You had, look at Char, what six nine when he played. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these guys are huge, and you don't realize the the speed of the the game or the toughness of the the game until you get down close to that ice. When you're up high, it's like by getting an airplane; everything's going slow. But you get down right close to it, and boy, it's 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 a different game altogether. You're in the broadcast booth, you know, for all of the. Nor, or excuse me, the wild games, <clears throat> you have to be at that vantage point. Do you prefer watching a game up there, or would you rather be ice level? No, ice level is too close. You can't You can't really – Head. my eyes don't move fast enough to see what's going on on both sides. You, I'd rather be up a little bit higher. But some of these rinks are, are built uh, a little bit too high for broadcasters. You know, uh, you see more of the element of the game. And it's interesting, some of the arenas now are – they have the two-tier press boxes where the lower tier is for the uh, print media and the upper tier is for radio and TV. Well, the problem with that is the lower tier in some of the arenas, they open up their computer screen, and if you're sitting up on top, that computer screen will cover up half the ice. So you have to stand for the entire game. It's just, it's just you know, it's a mistake that was made. That Of course, when they build these arenas, they don't really talk to the broadcasters about what would be good and what would be good. What, what would be bad but uh for the most part we but we have monitors now uh, you know it's a little bit easier to watch some of the replays sure uh, yeah. and most of and of course all of those come off off the television uh you know feed that they have so besides your teammates and great players who were some of the characters you had on your teams and and guys you played with and and against Oh, we've had characters. Tommy Williams, who hails from Duluth, he was a character when he played. He, I mean, he's, he was the, a guy that could he could dress in seven minutes. He'd come into a practice, and he'd be running late, and in seven minutes he'd be dressed and ready to go. <laughs> he goes out. <laughs> Wayne Hillman was another guy. He was a character. Uh, Bill Goldsworth. I mean, I played with a lot of guys that uh, were characters. In, in Chicago, Stan Makita and uh, – and Bobby Hall were, were two of my friends, especially Stan. He was just a terrific guy to be around and and to uh, be a, a, a part of a, a legacy of a, a, a an all star, which he was for many many years in the Hall of Famer. Any PG type pranks that you could share that were happening inside the locker room, whether it was you know filling uh, skates with shaving cream or something that guys would pull? Oh, there's always uh, we had. We did. Pull a few pranks ourselves over the years, and uh, I remember we had a kid by the name of Brian Brian Hextall. We had both Brian and Dennis Hextall. Their dad is a Hall of Famer, also uh, Brian Senior. And I uh, came in one day and and uh, getting ready for the game. And of course, we wore the green socks and the green tops and so on. Well, I took his green socks and replaced them with white socks, you know, <laughs> the, the hockey socks. And I told the guys, "Don't say anything," and they didn't. 
So he gets stressed, and everybody else got green on. We walk out, and we're skating on the ice, and some guy's hollering at and Hex, hey, Huckstra, are you colorblind? <laughs> or worse than that, he had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and then with Louie, we were out in Oakland, and I changed uh, sweaters. I took his sweater and gave him mine. And some guy was hollering During me the whole the game? Th- well, yeah, it was a warm-up. In the warm-up. <laughs> And some guy's hollering him, hey, Louie, Louie, remember me? I, re- I met you. And he's hollering at me. I'm not Louie. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's lots of pranks that we've had pulled over the years. He didn't want to f- fall asleep in the airplane because uh, if you didn't, you had tie shoes. They would take the, the lace of the shoe and they would take one of those Melmac, those plastic cups and make a big knot and tie it. So when you get up, off, get ready to get off the aircraft, all of a sudden he goes to put a shoe on. And he's got the, and he can't get the knot undone. Now he's walking to the airport with a, a cup hanging off of his shoe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's there's lots of lots of pranks that have been taken taking place over the years. Lots of funny stories too. I was telling the story the other day about Jude Druin at one time. We were playing in Minnesota, and I was on the bench. And of course, when you're on the bench, a lot of times you have a towel around your neck, and you know just to get the perspiration. And Murray Oliver went down in the far corner, and he's down, he's laying there, and Jude comes racing over. He says, give me the towel, quick, give me the towel. Uh, Murray is bleeding all over the ice. And so I throw him the towel, and, of course, all the officials get around, and Murray, they get Murray up, and he's coming back, and he looks okay. And I look at the towel. It's absolutely white. There's not a drop of blood on it. And I said to Jude, Jude, I thought he told me he was bleeding all over the ice. Oh, Tom, he said, I thought he was, but he was only laying on the face of that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. True story. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. You know, you, you, uh-huh. when when you're telling these stories and you got this big smile on your yeah. face, you still got all of your own chiclets, or did you lose a few through the years playing hockey? Well, they're my teeth. <laughs> okay. I've, I've paid for them. Well, yeah. from the dentist, or no? Uh, in fact, uh, I got hit one time in the in the mouth with a cross check, and it t- took about uh, six teeth out. Uh, three of them were already, you know, false teeth, but uh, I had the bridge work. And unfortunately, the guy who hit me uh, was my partner, Lou Nanny. No. He went to, uh, with, they had a, ki- a kid in Pittsburgh, the name of Bob Kelly. We called him uh, Battleship Kelly. And he was a big, tough guy. And he, I was going out to block a shot from the left point. I was playing the left side of that time. I was coming from the right point, excuse me. And the shot went wide. As I turned, Louis came on to hit Kelly, who ducked. And Louis, with his cross check, hit oh. me across the mouth and knocked out the teeth. And of course, you know, you got to keep playing. And I had I had the nerves hanging down from halfway down, some of them. And I had to, you got to finish the game. So I had to chew gum and pack the nerve, uh, the gum around the nerve to keep the cold air from blowing out. Because oh. so, so get a painful. little zinger, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that baby yeah, gets exposed yeah. to the air. Oh, lots of injuries over the years. But you know, we just we accepted them. You don't see a players, the players today. They're not hurt by the shot so much. I mean, you don't see the cuts. You don't see the stick uh, injuries and so on. What you see more is like knees and, and shoulders and, you know, things like that. Even goaltenders. I mean, I look at, I have a pair of uh, uh, Carl Wetzel who uh, comes in here quite a bit and played pro sports. He was with uh, Detroit Red Wings in Montreal at one time. But he brought me a pair of pads in the other day, and they have to weigh 40 pounds. But the pads today are so light, and they weren't very protective back in those days. Use horse hair and that. Yeah. But Gump Worsley and Cesar Maniago, I mean, their legs would be black and blue all, all, all season long. Nowadays, that's not the case at all. You don't see players, uh, especially goaltenders, get hurt by shots anymore. Usually it's a, it's a, a groin pull or a knee problem and things like that. You don't, there's not a lot of a stitching, stitching going on uh, in the dressing room like we used to have. You know, you mentioned the the injuries that the goalies would have on their knees and stuff. And and before the podcast, we were talking about a a guy that uh, is a friend of yours, and we've had on the podcast, Reed Larson, who just released his book about his... The shot. uh, The shot. shot, Your opinion, did he have the fiercest shot? In the, in the NHL? Well, he had one of them. There's no question. I mean, Bobby Hull, Dennis Hull, had a harder shot than Bobby Hull did, but he, Dennis didn't get the shot away quite as quick. But there's a lot of guys who had terrific shots. I wasn't one of them, but, you know, my, my puck only bounced twice of that, but that's okay. <laughs> but, but there are guys, I mean, they're shooting this puck over 100 miles an hour now. And uh, yeah. the equipment, I mean, we had wooden sticks. And if you order a dozen sticks, you might get three sticks out of that dozen that you could use because there's too much flex in the other ones. But now the these things are manufactured. 
manufactured, you know, with the composites they have and the angles and so on, it's totally different today than it was back in our day. So when you talk about that, that was one of our questions actually with, you know, with the goalie pads, they just soak up the water. You know, you know if you yeah. have back-to-backs or something, did they carry spare stuff or, or your gloves? I mean, your we, gloves? We see guys all the time having their gloves dried out during a game. Miko Koib was a guy, three or four times in a game, he'll get dry gloves. We only had one pair of gloves. That was it. Practice game. Yep. That's, that's what exa- you get. Exactly. This is what you get. Yeah, And that's, that's just the way it was. Wow, is that different? Yeah, it's totally different. You know, I look up here and I see a bag, a, a small bag over there, and that's one of the equipment bags that we had. I mean, now the, these things are, they're, you hide a body in there. I mean, they're so big, but uh, <laughs> not in, in our case. Let, let's go back a little bit. We were talking about, you know, the expansion back in 67 mm-hmm. when it went from six teams to 12 teams and the fact that there's 32 teams right now. You played in the era of those few teams, which begs the question, you had a talent. I mean, you were one of the few that made those teams. What did you possess that the, the Blackhawks and, and the North Stars were interested in? You know, the talent's certainly one of the things, but you have to be in the right place at the right time. There were a lot of players who were better players than me that were in the minors. They never got that opportunity. They never got the chance because somebody was just a little bit better on that team than they were. Uh, but had they gone to another team, maybe they would have been able to play. But the uh, trades were not very uh, rampant back, back in those days. And now, I mean, trades are made all the time. And usually it's follow the money in, in today's game. Yeah. In our game, that was not the case. We didn't make a lot of money, but we played the game for the love of the game. And uh, mo- the players, uh, all of us, I, I don't care who you were, you had a job in the summertime to just sustain yourself. We started the Players Association in 1967. That was my first year in the league. And out of my paycheck, which was $10,000, I had paid $1,500 for the Players Association to get started. All the guys in the league did that. And we got it going. And the players today are, are really the recipient of, of what we started back in, back in those days. And the guys before us helped us get a little bit more money, too. But it, it, it certainly has, has changed in today's game. But I will tell you, these guys, and I say this sincerely because I watch them, they work so hard all the time. Uh, practice sessions in the dressing room, you know, in their, in their, in their weight, weight rooms. They all have, you know, uh, nutritionists. They have, you know, physical therapists. They have the, their own strength and conditioning coach. They have, we didn't have any of that stuff. We had, when we travel, we travel with a team, one coach, one equipment guy, one medical guy. That's all that traveled. All right? So you're talking 20, 23, 25 people. Yeah. Now you're traveling at least 50 people total, including players. Sure, sure. It's a big, it's a big business, and it's a very profitable business. And, uh, but the, the facilities they have now are, are, are tremendous. I mean, it really is. It's fun to, to watch the, the players and how they gravitate toward each other and towards the game itself. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very grueling experience for these guys too but it's once again go back for the love of the game well it's that and you know they got to keep themselves in shape i mean they've got those massive contracts that that's some so much big money there right now it's just compared to when you folks played you i mean you talk about have to have and have a job they need to be working out during this this the summertime yeah we didn't have the those facilities to do all of that so we had to do it on our own and uh, <clears throat> it's interesting because you, you watch the players today and they, they go, like I said before, 12 months of the year. And, but I still think they enjoy the game. They enjoy what comes with the game also. And uh, to play, you know, to be able to play 500 games in the NHL or play one game in the NHL is an accomplishment yeah. uh, for a lot of people. Just say you've been, you've been there, done that before. And, you know, it's fun. And you meet so many characters along the way, some good, some bad. Yeah. But you really – have a relationship with your teammates and i i can tell you there's guys that i haven't seen in years but when i run into them it's like they were there yesterday talking to me i mean that's how close it is it's a family yeah it really is and you have to you know when i played june my junior hockey in st Catharines, i mean uh, it was in niagara falls there was Derek sanderson in in oshawa there was bobby Orr, and and uh, you know you can go through the the whole whole uh league and and the junior teams in those days were sponsored by the nhl teams and so you got a chance to really you know build uh, acquaintances and friendships with all these players over the years nice 
Give a quick shout-out to a couple of our sponsors. Thanks to our friends at Market & Johnson, longtime supporters of the great game of hockey, and our youth throughout the Chippewa Valley. And Northwoods Therapy takes pride in being your choice for physical therapy in the Chippewa Valley since 1981. Northwoods Physical Therapy is a clinic where you can receive the care you deserve and are treated like family. And Mogi and I have visited there many times for many reasons, and I'm back in the game after rotator cuff surgery. Thanks to those There you guys. go. Getting ready for the season. You know, the next question I want to ask you, um, I, I was told, or Mogi and I were told by Dean Talifus to set aside a half hour for your answer because you get into great, great detail here. <laughs> and, and, and Dean was I know what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> that penalty shot. Yes, sir. You're yep. exactly correct. <laughs> well... Kind of embarrassing for me and also for Ken Dryden. Uh, embarrassing that I scored and embarrassing for him because he let me score. Uh, well, I shouldn't say he let me, but uh, people say, I had a breakaway. And people well, how did you get a breakaway? You're a defenseman. Well, I was coming out of the penalty box. <laughs> so, And when they went to clear the puck, uh, they shot it towards me just as a clearing attempt. Hit my skate, and I just followed the, the path of the uh, of the puck going in over the blue line. That was in Minnesota against the Montreal Canadiens. And uh, I can remember going in there, and it was Guy Lapointe, who became a scout with a while and a very, very good friend of mine over the years, uh, playing for Montreal, all-star defenseman. He dove at me, and he tripped me, and I slid, and I slid through, out through the ice right to the boards, and I went down, and, and uh, Bruce Hood was the referee, and Bruce came over and said, are you okay? I said, yeah. I said, he's got a penalty, right? He says, well, you got a penalty shot. I said, Bruce, I don't want a penalty shot. <laughs> Put him in the box. <laughs> Bruce, I don't score goals. Why Why would you do this to me? It's a packed arena. It's one nothing in favor of Montreal. He said, well, you got one. So go back to the bench, and Jack Warden was our coach. And Jack looks at me. He said, what's going on? I said, I think they got a penalty. And so Bruce comes over. Come on, Jack. we got to go. Let's, let's move it up. He said, well, what? What's going on? He says, Tom's got a penalty shot. Silence. <laughs> And Jack looked at me, and he looked at Bruce, back to me, and back to Bruce. He says, does he have to take it? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, Bruce, I think I broke my leg. He said, get your rear end out here, or words to that effect, or be, delay a game. So I went out, and the ice was wet. And if you've ever played, with, the ice is a little bit damp in different places, and the puck sticks. And I'm thinking, if I can go from the red line all the way in and just – keep the puck going forward, I'll be all right. <laughs> so I went in, and uh, as I got towards the top of the circles, I shot. And Ken was not expecting me to shoot at that point. And he opened his legs, and I shot for the corner, and it went right between his legs. <laughs> so <laughs> I went back. Better, be, better to back? be so lucky I, than good. <laughs> so I went back to the bench, and I looked at Jack. I said, Jack. Was there ever any doubt in your mind? And he just pulled his head the fedora down that time. The, all the coaches were had, pulled it down over his head and walked to the end of the bench, and we <laughs> wound up tying the game 1-1. That was the final. Oh, oh, nice. <laughs> That's a great story. So you talked about, uh, you know, making it to the NHL. You know, if, if it's one game or 500 games, you know, obviously wonderful accomplishment. Well, you played 701 regular season games and 42 playoff games. So as a defensive defenseman and a tough defenseman, how are you able to consistently stay in lineup? Well, in those days, when you had injuries, you had to play. I mean, if you had a, you know, you had a, a finger, a problem with the finger, you, you, you played. I mean, I, I remember going down to block a shot we were playing one time, and I blocked it, and it uh, hit the side of my face from about 10 feet out, slap shot. And it broke my jaw in two places. It broke the orbital bone, broke the cheekbone, knocked out a couple of the, a little bit of the bridge work I had. And, uh, and so I obviously couldn't finish the game. They take me to the hospital and they do the x-ray and say, yeah, we're going to do a surgery. I have to wait two days for the swelling to go down. And they get, and they wired me. I was wired for six weeks. I missed one game. I played and I had to travel with uh, uh, a blender and I would have to, Turn into like a, a liquefy everything, you know, with ground beef and hot milk and mashed potatoes and peas. The guys didn't want to eat with me. Looked like a frog in a blender. So <laughs> I said, "Get out of here." So, so, and I—that's what I had to survive on, just a liquid diet. Because, and I had to carry uh, cutters with me, wire cutters with me, and the trainers had to have wire cutters. So something happened to me on the ice, and I had to wear a helmet at that time because to protect. But the guys would punch from underneath. 
And, uh, uh, but you know what? As I said before, if you could skate, you had to play. It didn't matter if you were sick. And I remember being on the bench with the fl- having the flu and having a bucket beside me because of being sick to my stomach during the course of the game. But you had to play. Yeah. And then when my, my, my blender broke, we were in New York, and uh, I went and asked about getting a new blender, and they said, the answer was, we, we don't buy appliances. Oh. So I had to just get one, and they were like $35 or something like that in those days. So, but it's changed. But it's changed. And, you know, we, we were kind of put in a situation that we, you, you couldn't fight it at that time. It was, uh, uh, they were in control. But now I think the, between the players and the owners, I mean, they really have gotten together and built something that's, that's good for everybody. And so uh, they're much more cognizant of the fact that when a, a player is injured that you need that time to, to heal and and uh, you know, get ready for that, that next game you play. In our day, we, we pretty well played all the games. I've talked to guys who play with broken legs. And fractures, you know, stress fractures sure. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, just played. We, uh, you know, that that leads me to my next question. You know, we interviewed a, a former Blackhawk by the name of Jake Dowell who taped his foot for, I don't know, three, four games because it was broken. And he didn't want to lose that spot in the lineup. Now, you're talking about a broken jaw. Any other sport, uh, hockey is the toughest one. Is there any other sport that you can think of that players are that determined to stay in the lineup that they will go through that? Well, you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose your position. That's one of the reasons why you stay in yeah. there. You want yeah. to make sure that somebody doesn't come in and takes that position. But I, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I mean, every sport has its difficulties. I mean, I look at I look at baseball. I look at the Twins. They, oh, what? How easy? Oh, it's not easy. You're out in the field there, and that Astro turf could be 140 degrees this <laughs> year out there in some of these places they play. At. But every sport is difficult. Football is tough. I mean, you're getting hit every 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 play, and you know, and that uh, the recurrence of that certainly has led to some catastrophic uh, injuries over the over the course of time. But you know. I go back to the love of the game. We we enjoy what we did. We're appreciative of being able to to uh, play, and uh, it wasn't so much about the money as it was about being able to participate and say, "Hey, I played in the National Hockey League." Yeah. Another shout out to our sponsors. <clears throat> First off, Dooley's Pub. They've been Eau Claire's home for hockey and all sports fans since 2005. Dooley's Pub is a proud booster of the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and local high schools. Dooley's is located on historic Water Street, providing excellent food and service and has all of your favorite sports televised at all times. And Hertel Law, the law firm that you want on your side, focusing on criminal defense and personal injury. Harry Hertel has been obtaining results for clients in the Chippewa Valley since 1981. When you need legal help if injured or accused of a crime, Call 715-832-4330 for a free in-person consultation. And Kelly Heating and Electric. Dedicated to serving their customers' heating and electrical needs efficiently, they have been named one of Bryant's Medal of Excellence winners. They provide expert advice from a friendly staff that can provide you with the knowledge you need to make the best decisions on your next electrical, heating, or air conditioning product. Tom, we've had a few of your former teammates, friends on. We've talked about uh, Dean Talifus. We've had Tom Younghands on, Reed Larson, Lou Nanny. When the microphone's on, those guys speak highly of you. When the microphone's off, they like to tell some jokes. Any shots you'd like to take, <laughs> former teammates, it's your turn in the box to, to, to give a little story or two about them? <laughs> well, there's there's always, always stories, you know, that uh, come with uh, being teammates and the pranks that are pulled at times, you know, and, and uh, they're always um, never malicious. I will say that it was never done to hurt anybody or hurt anything they owned. And, and, uh, but we had, as a, uh, as a player, you're pretty well bonded with these guys. You're with them all the time, every day of the season, pretty well. You know, you go through a, a season, it's 180 days or somewhere in that, that neighborhood and you travel with them. You're on the same aircraft and, and everything. I remember we had, uh, I was rooming in uh, St. Louis, and Brian Hextall, again, was my roommate. And I had gone to bed a little bit early. He came in. He had a f- couple of cocktails, I think, and he wanted to be a little bit noisy. And I said, Brian, stop it, or I'm going to take you, put you down the floor, and I'm going to put the bed on top of you. I'll take the mattress. He said, oh, yeah. And he, he, oh, yeah you're going. And he kept it up, so finally I get up out of bed. I put them on the floor. I put the mattress on top of them. Put the box springs on top of the mattress, and I laid on it. 
<laughs> and he was trying to get up, and he got up, and all of a sudden I hear this pop, and his knee popped. Oh. Uh-oh. So now what are we going to do? Well, we better call the trainer, Doc Rose. Doc, here's what happened. But we have to coach this because we can't let our coach know that how this really happened. Our coach was Teddy Harris. And he said, uh, well, he said, let's just say that he, he caught in a rut in the morning skate and the knee didn't respond very well and started to swell up. Okay, great. So we had the story all planned. So uh, Hexy went down first and limping. He had a, pair, he had a cane or a crush. I can't remember what she had there. He goes down and he talked to Teddy. And I go down and Teddy called me over and I said, yes. He said, uh, what do you think about the hex style thing? I said, yeah. I said, I didn't realize he had said he caught it in a rut this morning or something. He looked at me and said, he said, you put the bed on top of him. That's what he told me. And you laid on it and he popped his knee. So, so I said, I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that was not a very, a very good start with that, with that conversation. It didn't go, it didn't go very far, but. I knew that from that point on. Don't you're going to get caught. You tell a fib, you're going to get caught. So That's be careful right. of that. But so, Louis, Louis is always fun to play against. We uh, we had a game at here in, in Minnesota, and he and I were on the ice together. We were a tandem, and he was on the right side. I was on the left side. And he come out back to the bench, and he said, "I lost my contact." I said, "What?" He says, "Yeah, my con- I, well, how are you going to find it on the ice with everything else?" And yeah. we used to look for him, but he could never find him anyway. Yeah. No. So I said, do you have another one? He said, yeah, it's upstairs. I said, well, go and get it. So he goes upstairs. He comes back. We have another shift. I said, how was it? He says, I, I can't. I can hardly see it all. I said, well, let me look. So I, I looked in his eye. He had two contacts in the same eye. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was Louis. <laughs> yeah, both contacts. Now we had a game of Pittsburgh, and he and I were playing together again. And he, Louis comes up, and he ties a little t- little bit of a toe drag with a puck, and he'll go around and he, his chin's out. And, and Dennis Outchar was a defenseman, hard hitting defenseman for the Penguins. And he spotted Louis, and he came up and he hit him with the shoulder right in the chin, knocked him out. Down he goes. Louis laying on the ice. He said the only things he thing he remembers is me coming over, standing over top of him. I said, Louis, before you go, can I have your condo in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> You know, injuries were part of the game, and we we used to joke about it. You know. Huh? You know. Yeah. Oh, so but, tell uh, me, uh, how how do you guys pick roommates? Who decides who rooms the coach with does? Who? The coach, coach does. Yeah, coach and if does, you're yeah. not getting along with a room, a roommate, then uh, then of course you'd want to uh, you know go to the coach and say this isn't working out for whatever reason. I don't know. Uh, I never had a problem with a roommate. And, and, yeah, I was with Barry Gibbs for many many years. He was a great he was a great roommate uh, with me. Uh, we played played a lot together. We did a lot of the same thing. We watched the same TV shows and. Uh, you know stuff like that, but it was all it was always fun. But you want your roommates are really important nowadays. Most of the guys, the seniors especially, all have their own rooms, and because uh, guys have different you know personalities. Maybe some guy likes to get in the middle of the night, and watch TV, or read, or whatever. So you want to make sure you put guys in the in the same same boat. Uh, when I was in Chicago, Pat Stapleton was my roommate, and he was a prankster. And I went in the shower one time, and I came out. And open the door. I couldn't get out. He put all the furniture, and he wedged it so it was always against the back wall, and I couldn't get out. Oh, the shower. All, all the furniture. He took the bed. He took the dresser. He had everything. <laughs> and then we're we're in Montreal, and he's uh, you know, and he he likes to sleep with the window open. It's cold. Montreal was cold. You know, sure. twenty yeah. below zero. Sure. I said, it's cold. It's freezing. I'm the senior guy here. He says I get to choose. Yeah, you know, okay. So finally, I got up and I put the w- window down. He put it back up again. I put it down. He put it back up. He came over, and grabbed my bed sheet, and he threw them all out the window. <laughs> now where they landed, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't have any bed sheets after that. One. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, um, <clears throat> back when you were playing at the Met Center, a rumor <clears throat> has it that the NHL players prior to the Met Center being tore down, voted that was the best ice in the NHL. Is that true? Yes, yeah, that's one of them. Edmonton was very good also. Edmonton was terrific, and, and Montreal was good. I mean, you're looking at some cities here that uh, uh, really hit, took pride in, in, in what they did. Not that they all didn't, but a lot of them had other, venue, you know, had other uh, events going on in the buildings, too, when they cover the ice and take it up and they put dirt down because the road deer's coming to town they got the circus coming to town, all this stuff. But Minnesota had really good ice. Bill Peters was the guy who ran the ice surface uh, equipment for, for us. 
And it, it was great. It was, really was. And uh, the guys used to appreciate coming here. And the bad thing about that is they all like, they're all such good skaters. They want to be on this good ice. That made it tougher to play against. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And, you know, and they, yeah. used to, they used to do things like to, uh, for the visiting team coming in, the bench was always a little bit lower because it's harder to get over the boards. You didn't have as much space because it was more crammed. Yeah. But now everything has to be identical, and they check everything. All the equipment has to be checked. Uh, even in playoffs back in the early 70s, Frank Advari was the referee in chief, and he would come into a game, a playoff game, and he would check all the sticks because there wouldn't in those days and make sure that it was a half-inch curve and no more, and then he would stamp that stick with a, a rubber stamp in green that it was okay to use that stick. Mm-hmm. Well, as soon as he walked up there, we'd grab the heater and oh, we'd, yeah. we'd bend the sticks and we'd get them back where we wanted. <laughs> now, if you got caught, it was a fine and a penalty and everything else. But uh, uh, <laughs> everything has to be subjected to uh, scrutiny nowadays. Yeah. So you played with some greats on your teams. Of any player, past or present, who do you want to share the blue line with? Oh, I'd say Barry Gibbs. Barry Gibbs. I mean, we're, we 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 roomed together. We did a lot together. We communicated well together. And I talked to Barry a couple times a month still. He's out He's out in uh, nice. Kelowna, I believe. He's got a place there and a place in Arizona. And so we talk. We get together when uh, we go out, when uh, we play against the Coyotes, wherever they're going to play next year, I guess, back in the, the Mullet. Uh, Mullet Arena. But nice arena. But it's a great college arena. But it's not built for NHL. But, I mean, he would be the guy, I think, because uh, we, we got along so well. And he was he was a tough nose guy also he we had a situation in boston one time where he got into a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a ruckus with the johnny mckenzie and they were down on the ice and and barry was on top of johnny and as he reached over johnny bit him on the cheek oh bit him. and i think Orr jumped on top of barry gibbs i jumped on top of bobby Orr, and that picture's in, in the other room there right now in one of our rooms here and uh as you can see, we have a lot of memorabilia here. Yes, but he, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, that picture picture is still there, and and uh, I, I remember it well. But it's it's been it's been a great ride. Oh, what would happen to a guy nowadays if he gets caught biting someone? I that'd be that'd be long suspension, yeah, but, wouldn't you oh, think? Well, they get suspension, yeah. But you know, it, and it's, it's happened. I think Ty Domi didn't his dad bite somebody, and he but so I think it was Domi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some of nose or and, and it, it, head butting. I mean, yeah. Or yeah I like the I guys guess. that lean over and lick the the shield just to irritate the other players. Well, yeah. Marshan yeah. was licking the faces yeah, of guys, I, well, I so that's uh, <laughs> interesting. Well, the, league, yeah. the league's done a pretty good job, though. They really have of, of uh, taking a lot of the nonsense away from from these players. Well, I think guys now, in my opinion is they're all. I mean, it's they have these big buck contracts, and I mentioned that before, and. They try not to be careless around each other because, you know, you're one injury away from losing your whole career. Oh, you you bet you are. I mean, we've seen and we've heard of players who have gotten hurt, you know, who's a young boy out in, out in Boston who went in the boards in his very first shift and broke his neck. Yeah, and, broke his yeah. neck, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it, those those things are dangerous. And, you know, it used to be people would throw things on the ice. Yeah. And the the glass now is, is fairly high. It's hard to do that unless you get a hat trick, and then there's all kinds of hats going on the ice. Uh, but I think, I think for the most fans, players are pretty, uh, you know, aware of not throwing things. I remember Jacques, Jacques Demers, a coach, a long-time coach in the NHL, a broadcaster, and uh, he got caught because when he wanted to slow the game down, he always had some coins in his pocket. He would throw them on the ice. Oh. And they say to the official, hey, there's some coins over here on the ice, and that would slow the game down just a little bit. Well, he got caught. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> He's lucky nobody yeah. got seriously yeah. hurt either. Yeah, well, he always did it when there's stoppage of play. Oh, sure, Stoppage sure. of play. Then he would say, hey, there's some coins over uh-huh. yeah. Okay, yeah. well. You, in your era, played with some of the, the greatest people. You just mentioned Bob Yor. You talked about Bobby Hall, Stan Makita, and, and the list goes on. Oh, Gordy Howe. I mean, the list, I mean, I played in the 60s, and there's, you know, just 12 teams. So there's a lot of terrific Gump Worsley. And, and that, look at uh, Glenn Hall. Glenn Hall, a long-time goaltender. Played 502 consecutive games in the National Hockey League. 502 as a goaltender with no mask. Oh, that's, yeah. And we got think cut when goal when goalies got cut. You'd stop the game. They go upstairs. They get taken care of, stitch wise, whatever, and come back and finish the game. Finish the game. 
Oh, yeah, it's a different it, different ball game. As I rate the players, me personally, back in your era, I, I put Bobby Orr, Gordy Howe. Do you have a player that you look upon back from your era that would be num- a couple of the top players that you played against? Oh boy, that's uh, um, the list goes. Tim Horton. Oh sure. Tim Horton. I mean, look, uh, you know, my favorite player was was Jean Bella, but as I said before. I mean, there's certain players you look up to, and you appreciate to play against Pocket Rocket, Richard. Oh. More, you know, the Pocket Rocket. I mean, I. Uh, the list goes on, and when you see them coming down, I mean, Gore, and I and I say this about uh, Jean Beliveau, but of course the captain of the Montreal Canadiens for many many years, and I'm playing in, in Montreal, and it's one of my first games in the NHL, and all of a sudden it's one on one, he's coming down on me, and I'm thinking, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> and so miserable, I'm watching him, and he comes down, and he threw his head to the side, and I went that way, he went the other way, and went around me, and uh, and didn't score, but I. Another one of life's lessons that you you learn. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do your job on the ice. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so let's we got to talk about something here. Your career was cut short. You were you were thirty two years old. Okay, due to a rash. Uh, where I read it was referred to as the gunk. Okay. Yeah. So other players have had this affliction as well, but nobody had it as bad as you. Was it tough? <clears throat> For you to have to leave that game, I mean, 32, you had quite a few years left to play. Yeah, I figured I had about another three years, three to four years, and that's when I was just starting to make a little bit of money, too. But oh, uh, man. I was kind of uh, pushed out because when we don't know what, still to this day, we don't know exactly what caused it. I mean, I had a lot of different uh, doctors looking at me. I was going to Marshfield, Wisconsin, to the dermatology center over there, and, and 3M was trying to get involved to find out if there's something in the building or in the equipment, and we tried you know, testing, you know, uh, allergy testing with a bunch of, but couldn't couldn't find out what it was. But it started a little bit on my left arm, just about the size of a quarter, and then also went to my side, and then got a little bit bigger. And it got to the point now that uh, during the season, it was from my waist to my neck. Oh. And it was secreting like a bloody yellowish pussy liquid. And I had to wear towels around my, my body, otherwise it'd ruin my clothes. Sure, so I had to wear that, but the problem with that is when it dried up and I pull a towel off it, oh. it would reopen the injuries again. And I, I wound up at the end there, when I would travel, I had to sleep like in a straight back wooden chair with a sheet over me. I couldn't lay down in the bed. It was painful. And so I, and the, the team and the doctors, I mean, they were great. They tried everything. They'd spend $100 on a, a jar of cream and just cover my body with it and try and cool me down, but... Never figured out exactly what it was. And I know that Marion Hosa had a pro- similar problem in in Chicago. Now, whether it was the same as what I had, I don't know. I never talked directly to him, so I don't know that. I just know he had a skin problem, but he he left the game as well. Yeah. Oh, that's... Yeah. So nothing else? I mean, no other clothing, nothing you do causes anything like that? I try not to sweat. That's... Okay. <laughs> if I don't sweat, I'm Okay. <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's why you stay in the north. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Hey, where it's cool. Yeah. You know, in a situation like that, um, you know, nowadays I would think that there'd be some sort of compensation or or insurance that might help the player out. Was there anything in your day, or was it back then? Was the NHL just saying, "Hey, too bad, so sad. We'll see you later." The NHLPA was run by Al Eagleson, oh. and I was a member, and I was not in his stable. I mean, he had certain players that he had, like Tony Esposito and, and uh, uh, Lou. Uh, Lou uh, I, I don't think Louie was, was with him, but they were pretty close. But I called Al, and I said, Al, I've got to leave the game because of a skin problem. I said, uh, and the doctors are telling me it's a, it's a work-related injury. And he says, well, it's not. You can't claim insurance. I said, what do you mean I can't claim insurance? Why? The doctors are telling me it's work-related. You, and you're saying what? Well, he said, it's not caused from hockey, so you're not entitled to anything. And he hung up on me. And that was that? And that was it. And so I had to get an attorney, and which cost me you know, a third of what I was going to, and I didn't get much in anyway. I, you know, very minimal amount from what I should have received, but that was, that was just the way it was. And I, I didn't have the, uh, the pedigree of some of the star players. I wasn't his stable. So he really didn't have a lot, a lot of use for the guys who weren't giving him any money. Well, Ahead of the NHLPA. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Didn't he eventually get removed from oh, yeah. the Hockey Hall of Fame because of, yeah, the yeah. underhanded stuff he was doing many, players. Yeah, many guys like Brad Park said, 
if he is not removed from the Hockey Hall of Fame, I'm taking all of my, my stuff out of the Hall of Fame. And a lot of the players, star players, said the same thing. We're going to do the same thing. And so they finally had to remove him. He went to jail. He went to jail for a year because oh, yeah. he, yeah. was, he was uh, helping himself to some of the funds that should have been going to the players. I hope that there's a better check and balance now with the NHLPA. Oh, there is. I mean, all these, uh, all the players have their own lawyers and they have their own accountants and their own financial advisors and they have all this stuff. So it's, it's, and, and the, you really have to through, go through a very rigorous, uh, uh, testing by the NHL and the NHLPA to become a, become a, uh, an agent in the National Hockey League. Because a lot of players have been burned. A lot of players have lost a lot of money over the years by, people who have uh, taken advantage of the players yeah we know a guy who does some of the uh, financial work for a lot of hockey players and he talks about uh, how not having your agent be your financial guy you know keep those two things separate yep let the guy work on your contract but once the money starts coming in have someone different so there isn't any questions about who gets what well, and I understand that totally. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to remember when I came in, there was no very few agents. Eagles was a start. He started in 67 with Orr, maybe 66. But nobody really had agents. And we just did whatever the uh, the team told the manager told us to do. Here's your contract. Take it or leave it. Okay. Oh. Here's well, what you the get. Star, the yep. star players, you know, they could maybe bargain for a little bit more. Sure. I remember with Rem Blair, I, he, I, he was going to pay me $13,000, and I asked for thirteen five, and he sent me a letter. I wish I would have kept the letter, but it said, you know, uh, when I saw your request for an initial $500, he said, I almost fell off my chair. I, laughed, I was laughing so hard. Oh. Yeah, $500. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. I think 13000 that's what guys are making triple, quadruple that a game now, and you were making 13000 a year. There was one player that was playing in Washington. He was making, if you take the 180 days into his salary, he was making $64,000 a day. Oh. A day. Not a bad gig if no, you get it. No, it's not. No. <laughs> and good for these guys. You know, that's Absolutely. A, it could yeah. be a very short, short uh, career for a lot of these guys, but they, they manage their, their things pretty well. They're well, pretty well taken care of in today's world. What was it like for you uh, as a player to watch the North Stars head south to Dallas? Did that sting a little? Yeah, it was, sure it did. It was, it was not, I it was not a, if you remember, I, Norm Green bought the team yes. in 1990 and moved it in 1993. But I was doing the radio and TV before uh, Norm Green came to town and I quit. I wouldn't work for him. I quit. I heard too many stories about him. I said, "I'm not, no, I'm not doing this." Wow. Okay. And uh, so, so I didn't. And even I talked to Al Shaver the other day, and Al, you know, was talking about when he left the the, the North Stars too. I mean, he didn't didn't want to go to Dallas. This was his kids were here. Everything was here. Al's 95 years old. Lives on Vancouver Island. Sounds great. He follows the the Wild. You know, we're in the Al Shaver press box and. Uh, that is broadcast neat. booth and so al's 95 but boy he sounds sounds terrific and a lot of great memories with al over the years too in the travel and in the things that we did speaking of al shaver the legendary voice of the <clears throat> minnesota north stars yeah when you finished your playing career you went into the broadcast booth was that always your plan or did you did you ever think about scouting or coaching or just kind of fell in your lap and you ran with it? I thought about coaching one, at one time, but that went away in about 15 seconds. <laughs> I thought, no, because as a coach, and Mary, you two used to always say, you know, if you're going to be a coach, you better have a home with wheels on it because you're going to be moving all over the place. Yeah. And that's true. Even the player, even the, the coaches stay, but they're much more handsomely uh, uh, salaried now than they used to be. But, uh, it was Walter Bush, Walter Bush, who uh, was one of the leaders of bringing the North Stars to town here, that called me and said, we're changing radio stations, going from CCO to KSCP. Would you be interested in doing color with Al Shaver for the home games? And I said, yeah. I, I, thought, I thought, if I don't try it, I'll never, I'll never know. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so I thought, I don't want to look back, you know, 20 years and say, Gee, I wish I would have done that. So I got in the booth, and Al was very good. He helped me along and uh, did, did the things we had to do. And then a couple of years later, when uh, Channel 9 was taking over the broadcast, uh, they asked, uh, Walter called me, asked him, would you ever consider doing television? And I was, as a kid, I couldn't talk in front of people. 
I was terrified doing book reports and stuff like that. I, it was just, I just break out in a sweat. And I thought, well, give it a shot. And so I did. And that was 1978. I started broadcasting on radio and I'm still doing it today. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, Good for you. Well, I got to tell you, I do enjoy you and your partner on the, on the radio shows when I'm out in the car traveling wherever and I tune you guys in. You do an excellent job. Yeah, Bob Kurtz was great to work with over the years, too. We started in 1980 and uh, did, uh, did an awful lot. But you know what? Joe Donald really does a good job, too. He really, he's, he's dedicated. Uh, he, he's young. He's, he's anxious. And they'll say, uh, we need somebody to do the uh, interview with him. And I'll say, Joe can do it. So, you know, I, I've reached that point in my life that Joe can do it. So, but he's he's really good. He's fun to work. He's got three young boys and uh, make their home here. They love the area, and so it was great. The first year was tough on him. I had to go back and forth between Iowa and here, and, uh, but he's done a really good job with the team and it keeps the fans pretty well informed. Well, that's awesome. Nice. That's great. What are your thoughts on uh, the GM Billy Garen? How's how's he doing in your mind? I think he's doing fine. I mean, I look at the year last year. You always wonder what's going to happen. You know, the loss of Parisian Suter and what there's there was a gain there, but there's also a pain that comes with it. You know, and buying out two key players that he just felt weren't weren't good for the team, and for whatever reason, and that's a GM coming in here has got to make decisions that they think is are going to be the right decisions for the team long term. And I think he's done that. He brought in players last year. I mean, there was a great, over 100 points again last year, two years in a row. Yeah. And with a, a limited talent. I mean, we've got some good guys. There's no question we have some talent. But uh, it's 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 fun to see this team. And, you know, what's the team? I, I said last year I don't think they'll be very good. They were terrific last year. They had a great season, horrible playoffs. And they'll be the first one to tell you, and so will Billy. It just didn't oh, yeah. pan out yeah. for them. Yeah. So we'll wait and see what he brings in for this year and, and who he is able to – uh, secure for for this hockey club. Uh, I think, you know, when you look at Mark andre Fleury, it was a nice find for, for him two years ago when he came here. He just gave that team a little bit of a lift that they needed at that time. Last year uh, was another good year for the, for the team overall. But uh, unfortunately, people only remember the playoffs. In fact, they've been bounced in that yeah. first round so many times. Yeah, it's been rough. It's a repeating thing. So, Tom, you've been gracious enough to allow us to do interviews here, some of our guests at your bar restaurant, and we know that you host a lot of hockey events here throughout the year. How fun is it for you to get together with former and current players who stop by for a visit? Oh, it's great. And not just the players, the referees, the officials stop in here and I get to know them and, you know, they're, they're always fun. We always, I always had fun with the officials. I really did. I remember I had a game one time where, uh, it was, uh, Bruce who was refereeing again and he had great stature on the ice and I was wearing the C in that game, uh, oh. for the North Stars and, and Teddy Harris was our coach. And as I came back to the bench, uh, the penalty was called against our team and I did, I don't know what happened, but Teddy said, go in and tell, that was a, terrible call by the referee i said hey, teddy i didn't see i don't care if it's out or not you got the seat get out there and tell him i said but get, never mind get out there so i went over and i pointed my finger and i said bruce make this look good because i'm supposed to give you hell for a call that i didn't see but if i point my finger at you they're gonna think i'm really giving it to you and you do the same to me and we'll, we'll see. we went back and forth for about you know 30 35 seconds and then at, at, at the end of it uh, he said to me uh, what are you doing later? I said, no, do you want to get together? He says, yeah, how about if I meet you for a beer at the Marriott? I said, okay. So <laughs> so we met for a beer at the Marriott after the game. And I went back to the bench and said, I told him, Teddy, but he, he's not going to change his mind. change his mind. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and referees are big, and they're a big part of the game. I mean, these guys, I mean, they're scrutinized every call they make. The game is so oh, fast yeah. today, and the players are so big. Try and, when you've got a guy who's six foot four on that blue line, you're trying to see where the puck is to see if for an offside call. I think that the fact that they have the video replay has really, you know, solidified that that they are more often right than wrong. Oh yes, yeah, I agree. And, yeah. and yeah. It, it's a it's a tough job, and it, you know, with officials, they could be here for a game tonight. They're in Chicago tomorrow. They could be in Toronto two days from there. I mean, they and they have to fly commercial, and so they have to go through all of those things, going through the you know the mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, the different. Uh, Key points to get on the aircraft, whether it be security, whether it be customs, whether it be whatever it may be, and it's really a tough job. But I think for the most part, I, and a lot of guys they don't like the fish. Nobody likes the officiating. Some every call they make, somebody likes it, somebody doesn't like it. So, <laughs> yeah. damned if you do, damned yeah, if you yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah, that is very yeah. true. Yeah. 
Um, there are some phenomenal players in today's era. You know, Kaprizov from the Wild for one. Um, yeah, yeah. Is there anybody that you enjoy watching? You know, when you're in the broadcast booth, that you're gonna a team is coming in, you're flying to a location because you can't wait for this guy. Uh, well, Connor play. McGavin could be one of those guys. Sure. Uh, Makar, and you know, or you know, you look at different teams and and what they bring to the table, what stars they have. Uh, I mean, yeah, you always you always kind of glob on to the the superstars, but so often I watch defensemen a lot more too because I play defense. So sure. I watch the the mobility of the player today. Like I was a big guy and probably one of the biggest guys I said earlier, but the the mobility of these players today, especially on the blue line, is so good. And their speed, and their you know their smarts, and uh, you know how the how they train, and I mean it's just it's just fun to watch, and you know, and you like to see teams, you know, you, you like to see the, the the teams get better year after year after year after year, and you know you, and what I it's, it's to win the Stanley Cup is really tough, to get the NHL is really tough. The biggest problem of getting the NHL is somebody wants your job, and you have to. Do whatever you can do to retain that job all the way through. So, it's uh, it's it's kind of fun to watch. And if you're in that third line, fourth line, you want the third line. If you're in the third, you want the second. And that second guy wants the guy on top. <laughs> right. yeah. 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 yeah, Tom, this has been an absolute pleasure. We okay. thank you so much for your time. Right. Um, we we can't say enough. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Just uh, you know, we have we have. Great entertainment here. We got four rooms here. We lease them out sometimes or rent them out, whatever you want to call it. We do catering now. We're, we're doing off, an, an awful lot over the course of time here. We've got a good staff here. We are, we are the fun, we are the fun bar. That's how we look at ourselves. There you go. Doggone yep. right you are. And then folks, don't forget to leave us a, a, a thumbs up or a, a comment on our, on your social media. It helps us stay in the game. Mogi? Yeah, again, big thanks to Tom Reed, uh, our 100th episode. Congratulations to you too, JC, for that. Quite an accomplishment. And thank you to our audience. Uh, please remember our sponsors, Riverside Bike and Skate, Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, Hertel Law, Kelly Heating and Electric, Dooley's Pub, Market and Johnson, and Northwoods Therapy Associates. Please follow us on your favorite social media platforms as well as YouTube. And remember, folks, until next time, keep your head on a swivel and stay on your inside edges.